Reptile Expo is maybe the best place to get your supplies and to get your animals and to meet new people in the reptile hobby, but sometimes they can be a little bit overwhelming. So today we're going to take on how you can go to a Reptile Expo, get through the crowd, get what you want, and get it for the best price. This is the Ultimate Reptile Expo Guide. I'm Adam, you're watching Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles, stick around. So this weekend I went to a Reptile Expo in Toronto here in Canada. We've got one usually every six months, about 80 years or something like that. And this time it was a little bit of a smaller venue. So I think this is a great opportunity to talk about how you can get through a crowd in a smaller place and see everything, get what you want. Because although they are a lot of fun, there's a lot of people at them, there's lines and it's really hard to see everything if you don't know what you're doing and just kind of bumbling about. So the first thing you need to do in my opinion is make a list. Make a list. What do you need? What do you want to do? Who do you want to talk to? Because it's not just about buying animals, there's supplies there and online generally there's a list of vendors. People who are going to be there and selling things. Or if you're not there to buy things, maybe you're there to meet somebody or talk to a breeder or get information. Seminars as well and bigger expos. So make a list of what you want to do and when things are going to happen. If there's a seminar at 2 o'clock, make sure you're there at 1 so you can take a little walk around and get there and get into your seat or whatever the case is. If there's something you want to buy, get there early so that you know there's still some there. Or if it's something that you know you want to deal on, you're going to, there's going to be a lot of, say some sort of ball python that's not super popular or a really low demand or really low supply I should say, you can get there later because at the end of the expo there might be deals because these people don't want to take these animals home, they want to get rid of them. So make a list, check it twice, figure out what Pythons are naughty or nice. Number two, this one's really simple. Uh, in my opinion, the most important thing if you want to beat the line if you're going early in the day, uh, buy your ticket in advance. <laughs> I always do this. I always buy my ticket in advance because generally there's going to be at least two lines, usually. Uh, one for if you're buying a ticket when you're there, and then one for if you're buying a ticket in advance or you've already bought your ticket in advance and you're just showing them so they can scan the barcode or rip it up or whatever, stamp your hand and go in. It's almost always the shorter line for people who have already bought their ticket in advance. This is really with everything, not just reptile expos. So make sure that when you go, if you're going there at the beginning of the day, then have an expo ticket ready to go and ready to be stamped so that you can just walk on in rather than waiting in line for the lady in front of you to bumble with change in her purse or the guy to be shooting the breeze with a guy at the booth. Now as I talk, you're going to be seeing some of the expo and uh, just kind of walking around and what was available so maybe keep in mind what you're seeing because I'm sure expos near you are going to have similar booths, similar layouts, similar setups and the idea is you want to go either really early or really late in my opinion. In the middle of the day is when it's going to be the busiest and uh, closer to the beginning of the middle of the day so if it opens at 9 I'm always there at 9 because I like to get there and kind of get out right especially if you have to travel can take in consideration uh, what the traffic is going to be like. In my area, expos are almost always on Sundays, so I get there early, and then I leave early so I can beat the traffic because it's about an hour away from where I live. So get there early if you want to you know, go with there's no, there's no lineup, basically, or when the lineup is the smallest or the, uh, there's less of a crowd, or if you really want to deal. If there's something that you know, say you want a uh, bumblebee ball python or banana ball python or something that isn't cheap, but there's lots of and you're not uh, going to risk not being able to find one if you wait to the end, they might give you a good deal on it, right? For example, one time I bought a hognose snake near the end of an expo because the guy didn't want to take it home and I offered him a little bit less and I should mention don't be uh, a jerk, right? Like if it's a $300 snake, don't offer him 50 bucks, just insulting. But you can haggle at these expos, right? The price tag generally is not what that animal is going to sell for unless it's something really unique that people are fighting over. And there are times when if you offer a price and someone beside you is looking at the same animal, they can undercut you, right? Or they can kind of just go a little bit above what you're willing to spend. And a lot of the times the guy behind the booth will say, no problem, you got it. So just make sure that you're kind of using a little bit of strategy if you're doing that. Um, or, you know, offer them what's on the box, whatever the price is. That always works too. But just a note about haggling with people. If the price is, you know, 300 bucks for whatever it is that you're looking at, 
and you want to offer them 250 I don't think that's ridiculous. I think that a lot of the times they'll just say yes, or if nothing else, they'll say 275 And you can kind of haggle back and forth, be respectful, and if someone says no, that's it. The answer is no. And if you offer a price and someone just says no and looks away from you, maybe you're just better off to walk away. If they're not willing to haggle at a reptile expo, I'm not really sure what they're doing there. Unless, of course, they've had a lot of interest on it. Maybe they just don't want to sell the animal in the first place. So once you get into the expo, I would do a once around. Just kind of walk around, see what's there, especially if it's early in the day and there's not a huge crowd or the lineup behind you is big, right? So you can see how many people are behind you and you want to get around and know where everything is before there's hordes of people in front of the tables because then sometimes you don't know what there is. So for example, if you're there and you want to get a milk snake of some court, of some kind, like a, P a Pueblin milk snake, something like that, and there's not a ton in your area, do a walk around and see which booths have them, see what the prices are, talk to the people who are behind the booths. This is a great time because there's not tons of people, right? Because people are going to be handling animals and generally if someone's handling your animal, you're going to watch them and not the guy asking you questions. So get there early enough or at the end of the day when the crowd's gone and that way you can do a once around and then you can come back and know where you are because what you don't want to do is think, oh, I really want to skink. I don't really care if it's in Indonesian or Northern, but I'd much rather a Northern. And then at the first booth by the front door, you see a Irian Jaya blue tongue skink for 500 bucks and you say, all right, I'll get it. And then two booths over the one halfway across has a $350 Northern that, you know, they just want to get rid of because it doesn't fit in their breeding project anymore. And you kind of got that one and that's the one you want in the first place. So look around, see what's there. Um, and of course, you know, try to figure out what the best deal is and what the best breeder and most reputable breeder is because the guy at the front might not have the genetics that you want or maybe you don't jive with how they breed or their philosophy around breeding animals or keeping animals and the guy at the very far end you have a real connection with. If you already bought the animal, you're not going to have the opportunity to buy from the guy that you really want to buy from and maybe forge a relationship. So walk around first, see what's there. Next, you can handle animals and talk to people. This kind of goes with the first part that I was talking about, or the part that I was talking about just uh, a minute ago there. I like talking to people, right? And the, especially before I had a YouTube channel, even now more so probably, I like talking to personalities, not just people on YouTube. I'm talking about people who are breeding animals, right? Like everybody in my, in my country, everybody in Canada knows who Marcus Jane is, for example. The last expo, I had a great conversation with the breeders and the people who are working at the Marcus Jane booth. Another one is Chuck Royal. In Canada, he is the who's who of large constrictor breeding, in my opinion, and the opinions of a lot of people who really know about larger constrictors. So I like to talk to him. I got to interview him last time. Check out the video right here if you want to know a little bit more about that and see what we talked about. But also, uh, this our expo, we had a guy who had, I can't even remember how many genetics were in this animal. Like this is the most crazy, ball python that I've ever seen. It doesn't even look that crazy, but the amount of genetics and the amount of possibilities if you want to create a breeding project, this is what I'm talking about. I'm here with uh, Nathan from Chris Towers Reptiles and we've got something that has quite a few genes in it and I'm not going to pretend I can remember. Nathan, what is in this animal? Uh, from what I know, I'm pretty sure he is pastel, lesser, fire, cinnamon, and calico. But there's also a possibility that he could be NG, super pastel, and has spider in there. So with that guy, he's behind a booth and I'm just a guy. I just went up to him and asked if I could talk to him, ask if I can handle the animals. And if they say no, no problem, right? Take pictures with the guys that you watch, especially if you're in the United States and there's big YouTubers there. A lot of the times people go just to meet these people. I do that as well. Last time I was at an expo, I talked to uh, one of the guys who kind of inspired me to start a channel. Lord of Lion and I had a great conversation. These guys generally are very approachable and very easy to talk to. And then eventually, maybe if you're in the hobby and people kind of uh, look to you for advice or ask you questions because you've been doing it, you're posting on social media, then something like this happens. Speaking of great things, we have a buddy of ours over here, Adam Wickens from Wickens Wicked Reptiles. Did it. Got it right. <laughs> I think the, like, the really big thing is uh, reptile education. I'm trying to teach people that these aren't monsters or something weird. It's just like a cat or a dog except for it doesn't have fur and your mom doesn't think it's cute. That's basically it. But yeah. nothing to be afraid of and uh, they should be as loved as any other animal. That's right. I got to do an interview as a guest of the media crew who does these expos, which to me is mind blowing that they'd want to talk to me. But it was very interesting too because I could kind of use it as a platform to preach what I believe in and they kind of have the exact same mantra in that 
keeping your animals in the best conditions possible, quality over quantity. And we really agreed on that. And if you want to watch the entire full interview, check out the Wiccan's Wicked Reptile Facebook page. The entire thing is there. All right, you've been inside, you looked around, you talked to people, you touched the animals. Now it's time to buy what you're going to buy. And I generally leave, leave this to the end, or if you want and you trust these people or they're going to write you a receipt, something like that, you can buy it and they'll keep it at the booth until you're ready to leave. Because if you want to buy a PVC enclosure like I did last expo, you don't want to be carrying this thing on your shoulder through the entire expo. You want to be able to, you know, walk around with your hands free and meet people and shake hands or touch animals and hold them, whatever. So do your buying at the end or make sure that you buy and you trust the person to hold it for you after you've paid and then grab it on your way out. And I think with the buying topic, what I talked about earlier kind of really transcends into this uh, and just, you know, the haggling and just kind of trying to get the best price because a lot of the, the times these people, do, of course, respect if they say no, the, the price is the price, respect that. But a lot of the times they know that you're going to haggle with them. So if you see 400 bucks, they only really want 350 or that's what they think it's worth. And they're just preparing for that. That's just smart business. And being a guy who come from a sales background, I totally understand this. This may be new to you, but really, if you're not from North America, you're probably really used to this in everyday culture and everyday transactions saying, ah, it's 400 bucks, I'll give you 350, whatever. Don't be afraid to do that. Just be a nice person about it. And that's basically it. I guess the last thing I want to talk about is if you do buy an animal, safe exit. So what I'm talking about is in a lot of areas, this isn't going to be a big talking point, but where I live, it snows for most of the year or part of the year anyway, four or five months. So uh, if it's really cold, you want to make sure that you're going to have someone there to bring the car around, especially if you've parked a long ways away, or you have a heat pack and then you have them wrapped up so that you can traverse whatever blizzard or whatever cold conditions it is to your car and then make sure that they're comfortable on the way home and they're appropriately uh, packaged up. Right, so make sure that there's air holes if it's in a container made of plastic or whatever the case is, or if they're in a bag, make sure that they're not able to escape on your drive home. Because the last thing you want to do is get a five foot boa constrictor and then you look over on your seat and there's a five foot boa constrictor trying to climb out of your window on the highway. Don't do that. Be smart. Keep the animals safe. Number one priority. That's it. This was just a quick video. I wanted to teach you guys what I've learned from my you know, half decade or more of going to these reptile expos, there's a way to do it where you don't feel overwhelmed. Just make sure that you have a plan and follow that plan. And of course, go off and talk to that YouTuber that you watch all the time. I know that I've got a small following, but it feels really great when people come up to me and say, hey, you're the YouTube guy. And even the people who have almost a million followers or a hundred thousand subscribers, those guys want to talk to you too, right? So be polite. Take the picture, shake the hands, look at the animals, take care of, or put something in your hands that you probably would never actually buy. If you see a giant berm or retic there and you can't own them in your area, ask to handle them, take a picture with them, right? That's probably the best you're ever going to get to actually owning one. If there's something there that you couldn't own because of a restriction in you know, your bylaw or your girlfriend would neuter you if you brought one home, which is why I don't have a retic, and that's it. Thank you very much for watching. I really do appreciate it. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, please do. And because I do videos twice a week, that means that I'll see you on Monday.